So greetings, everyone. I would like to give a little talk today, which is not something that I'm very accustomed to doing, in truth. And uh, it's something that I debated endlessly before, well, after I agreed to do it, but before this very moment now, if I should do at all. Um, and ultimately, I obviously decided to do it because I'm here. Um, but this is something which has a degree of irony because what I am attempting to do is put something that at least for me and, and, and I think for many other people has been exclusively an experience that has developed organically and it's been felt organically. And there is a, a large degree of irony, I think, of trying to intellectualize and put something like this into words. Nonetheless, the subject matter that I'm going to talk about is something that I feel very passionate about because I mean in a very literal sense, this is not sort of romantic or metaphysical. What I am going to talk about is something that actually saved my life. And there's no question that whether or not I would be sat here today or whether or not I would be either not here at all or, or somewhere very bad if the things that I'm going to address hadn't been available for me to experience. So I entitled the talk, The Universal Spiritual Significance of Rastafari Sound System. And I'm going to attempt to see if this page full of bullet points that I've got can be woven into some kind of understandable narrative about what that actually means. Um, first of all, I, I should, first bullet point says introduce yourself. <laughs> so, uh, for those of you that don't know, um, musically I go by the name Kibila Amlak. Uh, my actual name is Jamie. I'm a producer, uh, a performer. I run a record label. I have run various sound systems throughout the years. But also I'm a photographer, uh, a videographer, a graphic designer, and not so much nowadays, but historically I've worked as a music therapist and worked in different kind of therapeutic settings, uh, mostly with kind of young men that needed some additional support in their lives. So what I'm kind of calling upon is, is all of those disciplines and, and, and the kind of multidimensional experience that I've had in sound system and, and how it kind of can work its way into that. So we have a, a, a phrase that seems to be brandished a lot and that is sound system culture. But I'm yet to really find the definition of what sound system culture actually is. And when a culture has no definition or a very loose definition, it becomes subject to many interpretations. And not all of those interpretations are going to move it in the direction that maintains the values that it was conceived within. And obviously, I'm, I'm very aware of the fact that sound system has countless uh, manifestations. You know, there's dancehall sound systems, there's bashman sound systems, there's sound systems that defend all kinds of things that Rastafari does not defend. But the reason that I feel that this is so important, this talk, is because just like reggae music was spread to all four corners of the world, so has sound system spread to all four corners of the world. But the particular type of reggae music that spread to all four corners of the world is Rastafari reggae music. You know, it was Bob Marley and the Wailers was a 
extraordinarily potent Rastafari um, vibration. And, and it was, I feel that potency of that message that carried it to all four corners of the world. And just in the same vein, it's the Rastafari sound system that seems to have taken root in all kind of contexts all over the world. And a lot of those contexts maybe are paradoxical or contradictory to the original inception of it. Nonetheless, it cannot be ignored that it is this manifestation of the sound system that has spread and it has really taken root in all kinds of places. So what I would like to try and do is not define what sound system culture is, but look at what is the ideals and what are the values. And then, you know, we can take it from there. I'm, I'm not trying to make any big statements or uh, define anything or reach any concrete conclusions. It's more a summary of observations and some questions for people to kind of take away and think about. So, it's my feeling and my experience that sound system is very ritualistic and ceremonial in its manifestation. And in this Western secular world, we are really devoid of anything ritualistic and ceremonial. Um, and that, I think, is one of the components why sound system has taken root, because it emulates something that we know deep down in our genetic structure that is essential to humanity. It's essential not just to humanity in perspective of what's good and what's bad. It's literally essential to us as human beings from a genetic perspective, even from an evolutionarily biological perspective the role of ritual and ceremony in day-to-day -day life is something that has been with us since the dawning of time. And this is a kind of unprecedented moment where so many of us individually and collectively don't have ceremonial ritualistic gatherings in our day-to-day -day lives. So, I think it's fair to say that we can identify things that have differing depths from a spiritual perspective. We can think about, you know, yoga, for instance. One would be more probable to reach some kind of spiritual elevation whilst practicing yoga than you would maybe go into an aerobics class. Now, I'm not trying to say that, you know, you can't have a spiritual experience doing absolutely anything. You know, the, the, the spirit of the divine is there to be found in absolutely everything. But I think it is fair to say that some practices and some environments are more conducive to it than others. And that is what I feel that sound system is. When it is done in the right way and the variables are correct, it is something that makes that more probable that the people will have some kind of spiritual experience or spiritual elevation. It's clear that dub music, as it's now been called since dub has seemingly become a genre rather than a process, is a very good music for partying. That's obvious because that has happened. However, the party and mentality is very individualistic and very hedonistic and counterproductive or counteractive to the spiritual because the spiritual elevation that can come in a Rastafari reggae sound system session is one that relies on the entire collective of people. It's not the sole responsibility of the sound system or the selector or the promoter or the people set in the space, it's also the vibration of the people that is present in the gathering as well. So if something tilts towards being overly hedonistic, then the chances are the collective element is going to suffer because the hedonism really is an, a vibration that 
wants instant gratification and it bypasses a lot of the processes that we need to have in order to actually reach a height organically. So I'm not going to overly go into the history of sound system because I think most of us should be aware, but that's not to discount the absolute importance of things like the transatlantic slave trade, things like the economic disparity, things like racial brutality. But I don't think there is enough time in this talk to give a full overview and specifically this is what I want to hone in on. But if you imagine that that is the context in which this vibration came forth, then it becomes even more paramount to understand about the, the process of hedonism as an individualistic against collective, something collective. Because the hedonistic instant gratification, denial of pain, means that when something tilts too far in that direction, there is no space left in the gathering for those that are suffering and those that don't want to escape the suffering instantaneously using some kind of intoxicating substances or some sort of behavioral patterns that mitigate against those pains. Again, just to be clear, I'm not, con I'm, I'm not trying to speak down about hedonism. If hedonism is your vibe, then go forward and be hedonistic. There is many places in society where hedonism is welcome and also encouraged. And I'm not here to make a judgment about whether hedonism is right or wrong, not at all. Hedonism seems to have existed as long as all of the things that I'm talking about. So therefore it stands to reason that it must have a place in society. My proposition is that it does not have a place in a Rastafari roots reggae sound system gathering if the aim and objective of that gathering is the collective elevation, spiritual liberation cohesion, togetherness, the caring, compassion and empathy that we would like to have amongst I and I when we gather. And sound system really is a very unique vibration because as far as I can see in my research, I think it's the first time that recorded music has ever been used ceremonially. And that sense of the ceremonial use of recorded music is literally Rastafari, because the, the use of bass in the way that bass is used in a sound system gathering is an inception that comes directly from the Africans that were forcibly removed from Africa, yet maintained in their memory bank the memories of their rites and rituals and ceremonial practices. And specifically, I'm referencing the Buru in Jamaica, which is a descendant of the Ashanti tribe. Now, the Buru can be credited with the drum patterns and the drum styles that became the Nyabingi drum pattern and drum style that is really the backbone of reggae music. And Count Ozzy, as a drummer, and percussionist that was under the school of a Buru drummer brought that into Rastafari and into reggae music. And that need for the Nyabingi drum pattern and ceremonial drumming of the Nyabingi to be present in Rastafari music pushed the need for the bass in the sound system to actually be a tangible experience, actually something that you could feel in your body, something that would resonate right down to a genetic cellular level. Now, again, I'm not proposing that this was something that was intellectually decided and then carried forth. I suspect this was an unconscious process driven by the need for the Africans in Jamaica to reconnect with something in their DNA structure that resembled home, that resembled the ceremonies that helped them understand their place on earth. 
So what I'm really saying by that, if you check it, because, you know, most of us are born into a world where bass is just bass, you know? We have bass in our car, we have bass in our home stereo, we have bass in our iPhone pods, and all of these things. But prior to this, as far as I can see, there was no bass heavy recorded music being recorded nor reamplified to the levels. So that Rastafari vibration literally pushed the boundaries of the equipment so that that bass could be felt and could be experienced and therefore sound system becoming from what I can see, the first time that recorded music, as opposed to drumming and chanting and so forth, actually became a ceremony. And that also means that bass is very powerful. And we know that power has two sides. Power can be used to elevate people. Power can be used to denigrate people. So this bass now that we have, is something that carries great responsibility because it is a very powerful tool. I've been like a... This is kind of reminds me of like school or something, you know. I'm completely and utterly unprepared. I just have lots of random words on pieces of paper and, 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 and I'm trying to weave it together into something. But I also, some of you might have been present that I, 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 I played here last night and I also played the night before. And uh, I'm a little bit sleepy as well. <laughs> so back to this term of sound system culture. Culture, I found this definition online and, and a lot of what I've, I'm referencing is from various articles that I've found and I'm sure if I was more academically accustomed, I would know that I'm supposed to reference the articles and give credit and I don't actually know how that system works, but I have them here. And if anyone wants to come at the end, we can take a look at them and I can tell you some of the people that have helped me get all of this thinking of mine into some sort of words. And this one, I actually can't remember where I heard it, but I heard this definition one time of culture being defined as place, prayer and people. And if you don't have all three of them, then you don't really have a culture. And I want to use that as one of the frameworks to explore this because I think I can break down the sound system, especially Rastafari sound system into those three categories to help me kind of identify what I'm talking about. Um, specifically, or not specifically, but a lot is going to lean on the prayer side of it because, you know, the prayer is really dependent on the body of people, like what they do, what they value, how they behave, what is, is their practices, you know, what is their moral and ethical framework and so forth. And I think prayer can also really be defined as the setting of an intention. And therefore, the intention of Rastafari reggae sound system is paramount. The intention that, you know, people like myself and others that are involved on a structural level, um, the intention that we set forth with to create the music and build the sound systems and the music we play and, and so forth. And also the intention of the people that are coming back to this thing about the, the, the kind of hedonism versus catharsism. If your intention is to be hedonistic in, in, in the gathering, then that would be destructive. And I really feel like, you know, there has been a significant amount of effort put into down pressing the potency of this gathering. And also, the, the, the down pressing of Haile Selassie. And I feel that it stands the reason that Rastafari reggae sound system is so powerful from a spiritual component that it should be shoulder to shoulder with all of the spiritual practices that have become commonplace in the modern world. 
and therefore needing to kind of intellectualize it and define it like this just wouldn't be necessary. But there seems to have been a concerted effort to downpress it so that if I make a proposition that Rastafari sound system is spiritually as relevant as yoga, as Tai Chi, as gong baths, as, as all of these spiritual things that have become pres present, that it can sometimes be sneered upon. And I hope that, you know, we can work towards trying to rectify that a little bit. So back to this people, place and prayer. The first segment of that that I would like to delve into is the place. And the place, you know, could be the place or the placelessness, because as I've already outlined, this Rastafari reggae music is the music of the dispossessed. So in essence, it, it could be defined as the, the music of the people with no place. And therefore, the place that the gathering manifests needs to be a place that is focused on the overcoming of suffering. And there's many factors that play a part in that. These modern times that we live in has put a very heavy emphasis on the visual. And visual is a strange sense because your vision, in many ways, just by engaging with the visual, it takes you outside of yourself. Immediately, if I look at anything, I see shape and form and surface and highlights and shadows. And all of that is essentially outside of me. So the visual sense tends to be a sense that puts you outside of yourself. And yet this modern times, specifically in the Western context, places the most heavy uh, emphasis on the visual senses. That's why all of our history is written as opposed to being an oral history. That's why the gathering has traditionally taken place in near darkness because it strips that visual, um, the potency of the visual to, to take you outside of yourself. It removes that as an option and leaves you inside yourself. And we're going to go into that a little bit further. The sound system has traditionally always been set up in a round kind of environment. And unlike any other recorded music amplification and reproduction, the speakers have been positioned in a way that face inwards. Distinctly different to a live concert setting when the speakers face outwards to the audience and you have a band or, or whatnot on stage and the band are listening to the music via the monitors on the stage. So immediately that puts a sonic disconnect between the performers and musicians on stage and the audience. And any of you that are musicians and that have been on stage or engineers, you know that the sound on stage can be totally different to the sound outside. Whereas sound system, the sound is set up in such a way that the sound system operator, selector, the people on the microphone, etc., are all within the same sonic landscape as the people which further brings it into this ceremonial type of thing that would the ceremonial, the memories in our DNA of ceremonial gatherings when we're all immersed in the same sound. That, of course, makes it more likely and almost inevitable that the people will gather in a circle, the shape that has been used since the dawning of time when we gather. It also means that the sound becomes omnipresent. There, there, if, if, if it's done correctly, the saturation level of the sound, the weight of the bass, the experience of being in the sound is the same if you're here, it's the same if you're there, it's the same wherever you go. And that again brings it into this ceremonial, ritualistic type of perspective. And we seem to have a kind of trend now where the actual material of the sound system, the speakers and things, becomes a focal point. And it gets set up with, again, a disclaimer, you know, because people are sensitive. And this is not trying to 
denigrate anyone or say that anyone is wrong. It's an observation of mine. One stack sound system makes it less likely that people will gather in a circular environment. It seems to be because a lot of people have migrated from the Psytrance world into the sound system. It also seems to encourage... Hello? It also seems to encourage this trend where people face the speaker boxes, which to me seems to, as an observer, observing the phenomena both as someone in a sound system session or as a performer taking part, it seems to be more hedonistic and it seems to be that it is less engaging on the collective component. So now I want to talk about the prayer. And we have with people, place and prayer. That was the place, this is the prayer. The sound connects us, as I already said. The bass, it connects us on a cellular level. You know, bass is something that dissolves the boundaries. It dissolves the boundary between you and the other. It dissolves the boundary between the music and yourself. It dissolves the boundary between the space around you because the environment is resonating at a particular frequency and you are resonating at that frequency as well. So in that respect, it becomes a transpersonal experience, i.e. a spiritual experience when we are submersed in base, if all of the other factors are also conducive to that. And sound is something that in many ways is irrational. It's very difficult to control the way that sound moves, especially the bass frequencies. From an engineering perspective, bass is defined as omnidirectional, i.e. you cannot control the direction that bass travels. So therefore there is a component of irrationality in bass. Whereas the visual, again, to go back, is very rational. And the two sensory experiences stimulate the two different components. Visual stimulates your rational self, which is the uh, an antithesis of the spiritual self. Whereas the sonic, saturated, bass-heavy sonic experience stimulates the irrational self, and I don't mean irrational as in loss of control, I mean irrational as the opposite to rational. Because in many ways, the spiritual experience is very irrational. It's something, as you're witnessing, which is very difficult to put into words, and I'm sure you know that from your own experience. We also have a trend in many of our languages where we refer to things using nouns. And this, is also not conducive in intellectualizing what is going on. So it can be argued, and it is argued in some of the research that I've done for this talk, that it would be more effective to use a verb, such as sounding, because sound in itself becomes an inanimate object. And as you know from your experience, I'm sure at this festival, sound is anything but an inanimate object. It's actually a living, tangible experience. So therefore, language that could be more conducive to seeing that sound is a living, tangible experience might help us really think about this in a way that highlights the potency of what we are dealing with. To stay with bass again, there's something about bass which is almost unfathomable, but I think we know it and we feel it, that the gamma waves in, in our brain function range 
of the frequencies between 25 hertz and 140 hertz. So for anyone that's not familiar with the technical terminology used to describe sound, hertz is the measure of frequency. And bass, coincidentally or not coincidentally, more mystically, sits within this frequency band. Now the gamma waves is associated with consciousness and specifically 40 hertz, which is a bass frequency that I think many people love deeply when you get that low note of bass and you know, the whole, there's nothing else you can think about in that moment. You can't think at all. The bass just encapsulates everything. 40 hertz is a frequency that stimulates the frontal lobes of the brain. And the frontal lobes are really responsible for consciousness, literally like what makes us human, what enables us to have an experience of our experience. You know, it's said in many spiritual traditions that our purpose here is to have a conscious experience of creation. We are creation become conscious of itself so that creation could experience the glory of creation. And the part of our brain that scientists have seemed to define that is most active when we are engaged in that is the frontal lobe. And the frequency that particularly corresponds to that is 40 hertz, which is a very bass heavy frequency. And the preamp in the reggae sound system is a tool that enables the operator to really tune those bass frequencies, which again is something kind of unprecedented in recorded music, that someone would actually go to great lengths to try to find the correct harmonics and the correct resonant frequencies on every single song that is played so that we can have this immersive experience within the Rastafari reggae sound system gathering. And I don't, I've never seen that anywhere else. And if I have seen it, it's been a direct um, inspiration from the reggae sound system world. And that creates something, a term that I want to use that I've borrowed from some other research of sonic dominance and sonic saturation. And this sonically dominant bass heavy music creates this sonic saturation, which literally forces you within your body. It forces you inside, which is the place that the spiritual experience begins. It takes you into yourself, you know, away from the distractions of your daily life. It allows you to tune into yourself, tune into your thoughts, tune into your feelings and therefore lays the foundation for the spiritual experience. And that's something that paral is paralleled in many sonic-based spiritual ceremonies, different caves and so forth that have been carved to resonate at these frequencies. Gong baths and, and other such sonic spiritual um, ceremonial gatherings or ceremon ceremonial experiences. Now there's another sonic use in meditative practice and that is sonic deprivation. So that's the complete absence of sound. And you know people go into these flotation tanks and so forth so that they can uh, have an experience in the absence of sensory um, stimulation to allow them to go within. Now, another very unique phenomena, specifically in Rastafari reggae sound system, is the space between the songs. And for anyone that's unfamiliar with this, you know, it really like freaks people out because they're not used to this. When they go to a music event and the selector just leaves a long gap from one song to the next, 
And people are like, wow, what is that? But I think why they are freaking out is because you are going from one very spiritually potent experience of sonic saturation to the polar opposite, which is complete sonic deprivation. Again, something that is uniquely organically developed within Rastafari reggae sound system. And all of these things, no hollow. A stapler would have been good, no? Ah, I see it there. I knew there was more on the prayer section. I nearly missed all of the important stuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Many of you will be familiar, of course, with mantra as a spiritual tool. The repetition of, you know, some kind of sound or some kind of language. And again, this is something that is present within the Rastafari reggae sound system. It's something that resembles mantra. I have never seen anywhere else when people reproduce recorded music that the same rhythm, i.e. the same piece of music will be played for such a sustained amount of time. In all other genres, you know, two, three minutes, and it's the next song, the next beat, the next melody, the next drum pattern. Yet, in Rastafari sound system, it is not uncommon at all for a minimum of 15 minutes with one piece of music, sometimes all 45 minutes on one rhythm. And that functions, I feel, to create something that emulates or is parallels the experience of mantra because there is no space for distraction. You really, you know, after 20 minutes of one rhythm, you're kind of on your own. You got nowhere to go. Like your enjoyment of that moment relies on you having an embodied experience and getting inside yourself and staying with that rhythm. And that can be uncomfortable. There is layers, just like any spiritual practice, yoga. There is layers where you have to stretch the boundaries of what you are comfortable with in order to find what lies underneath. Also, the way that the microphone is used forms another type of mantra. Also, the way the siren box is used, which is again something which is so random in its inception, yet it came, it found its way into the sound system and it formed an almost integral part of one of the things that we call sound system culture, this use of a siren box, the sound effects box. But it doesn't work without an echo unit. Now, why doesn't it work without an echo unit? What does an echo unit do? It takes that random sound effect and it repeats it and repeats it and repeats it and repeats it. And unusually, like almost never seen before with an echo unit, it wasn't used in the way it was used in a sound engineering perspective of just, you know, short echoes to help glue the mixes together. It was used as this really... Um, exaggerated effect where the repetition can just go on and on and on and on and on and on. And I can see the only real parallel in that, again, is mantra. So you have these two components, the repetitive rhythm and the sirens and the chanting and the use of echoes. And then, of course, there's the culture of vocal and version. So you have the vocal version, which will contain all of the information that gives you a chance to listen, tune in, maybe intellectualize some of the word sound that is being delivered. And then the dub version or the version or the instrumental, 
which is a chance to then embody the lyrical component of what you just heard and then stay with it and keep staying with it. And then maybe there's going to be cut two, cut three, dub mix 47, you know, and on and on and on. And again, this is something that I have not seen anywhere else. And the dub or dub, as I said at the beginning, seems to have become a genre, but I kind of reject dub as a genre. I think dub can be a genre when it's a party music, but dub is not a genre. Dub is a process that was first done to reggae music, which created alternative versions to the recorded material. And the use of these effects, like reverb and delay, is what kind of gave dub its distinguishing qualities. So back to what I said about, you know, referring to sound with something like the verb of sounding to keep in mind that this sound that we are living is a living entity and we are the living embodiment of that entity. It strikes me as no coincidence that one of the fundamental effects using dub is reverb. I don't know if you catch the word magic there. One of the things that gave birth to the sound system as a spiritual gathering is the dub versions. And one of the things that made dub is a special effect used post-recording called reverb. So we are literally, when we use reverb, we are reverbing the sound. We are taking it away from the inanimate objectification described by the word sound. And we are living, we are breathing life into it with the reverbing of it into a living, breathing entity for us to live and breathe and embody. The etymology of the word repeat, repeat is the delay. When we create an echo, it repeats. The etymology of that word, broken down into two pieces, is re and patere, I think is pronounced. Re in Latin means back, and patere means seek. So the use of repeats in echo is literally to seeking, you're seeking back, seeking back to the root of who you are and who we are and what our purpose is on planet Earth. One of the things that allows us to feel the bass and feel the sound is resonance, 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 sonance. The definition of sonance is the quality of a sound. So I was kind of blown away by this. this. I learned this like last week, you know, when I was doing the research and, and I'm not surprised that the terminology we have to describe this endeavor also seems to speak of its spiritual potency. I'm speaking way too slow. There's wholly more to get through, you know. <laughs> Let me try and speed up a little bit. You're being very patient. I'm very aware of the fact that I am speaking very slow. I'm very tired. So thank you for your patience. Yeah? Give thanks. <laughs> Give thanks. So reggae music, or Rastafari reggae music, to be specific, is like a body of spiritual text. Almost everything that you are going through, or have been through, or are going to go through, has been sung about in reggae music. Every solution that you could need for what you are going through has also been sung in reggae music. Now that's not, I'm not, 
at all saying that it hasn't been sung about in other musics. But just to add in that the type of music that forms the backbone of these gatherings is a type of music that if it was written down and compiled into a text, could be a text that could form the spiritual, could form the backbone of an entire spiritual movement. And that is of course no surprise because it's Rastafari reggae music. So the music is from the tradition, is from the culture, is from the collective experiences of the Rastafari brethren and sistren. Now, I definitely don't have time to get into a reasoning about cultural appropriation, but it needs to obviously be highlighted, especially in this climate that we're living in now. And like I say, I don't have time to get into that. And it really is another reasoning. However, I think it should be noted that the oppression and brutality of the transatlantic slave trade that was the precursor to even create the need for any of the Rastafari brethren and sistren to sing these songs is a form of brutality which may well be unprecedented in human history. So therefore it also stands to reason that a music which comes from such a horrific atrocity on humanity as the transatlantic slave trade will be a music that has extraordinary liberation potential. It has extraordinary potential for spiritual elevation if the people that created the music managed to create it from such an atrocity to serve as a tool to liberate the people that went through that atrocity. <coughs> now, like I say, going there takes us into a whole different direction of reasoning. But I think that is one of the reasons that reggae music has spread to all four corners of the world. Because if you have lived and persevered and resisted through such an atrocity and such a beautiful art form has been born as a result of it, there's almost no human being that hasn't been through something that won't find some form of healing, resonance and parallel to their own life in Rastafari reggae music. So that was the prayer of place and prayer. And then the last piece of people, place and prayer is people. So again, to speak of the irony and the paradox of even trying to do this. Uh, I think illuminates the fact that the gathering of Rastafari brethren and sistren or brethren and sistren that have some degree of understanding of Rastafari in the gathering created something that was really like an embodied morality. There was no rule book per se, but there was definitely an embodied moral framework that everyone kind of knew what, what time it was, you know, in the gathering. And that again also speaks to, you know, oral history and oral traditions and things being passed down in an oral nature as opposed to written. But it was most definitely there. I know when I said at the beginning that Rastafari's sound system saved my life. It saved my life because when I first entered the arena, 
I entered into a climate of embodied morality. And it was absolutely unlike anything that I had experienced in my life until that day. And unlike anything that I've experienced anywhere else since. Because to be in that type of environment where good behavior is absolutely essential, where being aware of your surroundings and aware of the people that surround you and submersed in darkness and submersed in frequencies that dissolve the boundary between you and other people was something that was so profound, it's compelled me to feel that I need to try and address it in this talk so that we can hopefully preserve some components of it. I think the only times that you maybe see some of this embodied morality written down is, you know, lots of catchphrases on the bottoms of flyers, things like, let good behavior be your savior, and up for vibes guaranteed, and, you know, even to the more extreme things like, uh, bring your queen and leave your machine, speaking to the violence that was present, you know, in some of these early gatherings that, it was sufficient to say that this gathering is a gathering that you gather up, you know, saying to the man, bring your queen, saying to the kings, bring your queen and leave your machine as in your gun. You know, that, that was the climate that this was conceived within. And yet even in a space as violent as Rastafari sound system existed, it created a safe haven from the violence, a safe haven from the type of armory that you need to put within, put around yourself if you live in a hostile environment, that type of armor that is not conducive to a spiritual experience, it allows you to drop it or at least put it to one side so that you can open up to something greater than yourself. Of course, it goes without saying that these gatherings his Imperial Majesty Emperor Haile Selassie was held as the highest ideal. And, you know, if I reminisce on these early gatherings, you walk into a dark room, sometimes there is literally only one light bulb in a big space and not no LED energy saver, fluorescent light bulb, original old school filament light bulb round coil of wire gets very hot. Now that light bulb would be positioned between the selector and a banner of his Imperial Majesty. Furthermore, the light bulb would flicker to the base because the base would be put in such a substantial current draw on the electricity that it would dim and illuminate in synchronization with the weight of the base, emulating a kind of candlelight or a fire. Again, completely unconscious, but I can't help but draw the parallel. You enter into a dark space, you gather in a round, ceremonial, sound system, ganja would be burning in the place, which would be being burned as a burnt offering. <coughs> it would form the incense of the place, the smell of ganja smoke. <coughs> His Imperial Majesty is held above everyone in the room as the highest ideal. Almost everyone in the room has, if not a total sense of the importance of Haile Selassie from a political, social, cultural, moral perspective. Then you have the Rastafari brethren and sistren that are revering Haile Selassie as God incarnate, as the most high in flesh come for the salvation of humanity. Now, Haile Selassie, if you study his rulership, his morality on an unprecedented level, his righteous governance on an unprecedented level. So you have a gathering which is almost in firelight, in darkness. The only thing you can really see 
is the illuminated picture of his imperial majesty. There was also consequences for misbehaving. And that's something that as seen has been kind of eroded with this one love type of um, viewpoint of reggae music. Now that's not to say that it wasn't a spirit of one love, but there was consequences if you misbehaved. There was consequences if you were disrespectful. And something that I think having consequences for people being disrespectful allows, is it allows for genuine inclusivity. And I think we've let some of this go in the spirit of inclusivity, but actually it's anti-inclusivity because genuine inclusivity means that absolutely anyone can come. And when absolutely anyone can come, that means absolutely anything is possible. And when we are creating an environment that is almost forcing people to go within themselves from sonic saturation to sonic deprivation. If we have the doors open to people who are traumatized, to people who have been through extreme oppression and brutality, then the chances of them slipping into a behavioral pattern which could be destructive for the gathering and destructive for the people and destructive for themselves is quite high. Therefore, one of the best ways I've seen to mitigate against that is consequences for misbehaving. And I know that kind of sounds a little bit oppressive, but I haven't seen in the absence of consequence anything good actually happen. Now, that doesn't mean that people should be in fear or we have some aggressive security abusing their power or anything of such. It just means that this is a gathering. There is a code of conduct. And there is a risk that people are going to be put in touch with something that is very painful and very hard to go through. And we have a moral obligation to protect that and protect everyone in the space. And it serves as a deterrent to allow people, if they're sliding into that space, and the desire to engage in bad behavior starts to overcome them, that they know that if they do that, they will be forcibly removed from the gathering. And some of that sort of misbehavior, I think, you know, comes into things like personal space, which is again something I've seen radically decline in the gathering over the years. Personal space, it seems kind of silly that I would even have to point this out, but you can't go to a yoga class with a lack of personal space. It doesn't work. You know, you can't go deep within yourself. You can't sit in lotus and, and meditate um, with a lack of personal space. If, if, if someone you know, accidentally knees you in the back whilst you're trying to meditate, it's very likely that you will be disturbed and come out of your meditation. So personal space, again, was something that I saw was an embodied morality. I saw hundreds and hundreds of people gathered tightly into a space, dancing in unimaginably creative and expressive ways, and yet nobody bumped into each other and nobody touched each other. And if that should happen by accident, the immediate response was to apologize and show compassion and show recognition that you might have just disturbed someone who was going through a very important process. And now I seem to witness that people even have no sense at all that they're pressing up against you, no sense at all that they've come and stood in front of you and, and taken the space. And that's not to point fingers or, or try to put anyone down, but it's to highlight that, you know, I think that the spiritual component will suffer if <coughs> personal space isn't something that is kind of becomes part of the embodied morality of the people in the gathering.
I thought that was on silent. So that means I've been talking for an hour already. Well, wow. um, two very common things in all spiritual gatherings is in is abstinence of intoxicant in abstinence of substances that will intoxicate you. Now, many cultural and religious frameworks have a zero tolerance policy for drugs and alcohol. Now, Rastafari sound system gathering, gatherings, I've never seen that need for zero tolerance because it is a genuinely inclusive gathering. And if you need some form of substance to help you shake off the various stresses of your week and so forth, then that is something that you need. And you know, that is something that may help facilitate a deeper experience. However, what I never saw until more recent times is people being completely wasted. So when I say there was no need for a zero tolerance, that meant people would come and drink a rum or drink a beer or, or maybe even take other substances. But the point is, if everyone else knows that you've taken another, you've taken some form of intoxicating substance, then you've taken too much. Because if everyone else knows, then it is becoming a disturbance for those around you. And it is commonly perceived in most spiritual disciplines that being sober is probably the best way to achieve the hikes. But I, I'm in the spirit of inclusivity. That's why I think Rastafari sound system has been amazing because it's a church for the churchless. It's a place for the placeless. It's a place for the dispossessed. It was never taking place in nightclubs. It wasn't taking place in formal spots. In Jamaica, it was an open air something. In the UK, where a lot of Jamaicans migrated, it was in community centers, in town halls. So <coughs> it didn't have this culture of excessive intoxication that we seem to have now that we've been forced into the nightclubs. Another common theme in, in many spiritual practices is sleep deprivation. And again, there's something else that you see, you know, if it's six o'clock in the morning, you're stone cold sober and the selector has been playing one rhythm track for 37 minutes and you are really tired. You can either get into a very bad mood and maybe feel like going home or you can overcome all of the physical discomfort, all of the psychological discomfort you can become the embodiment, the living embodiment of the sound. And then the sleep deprivation is an aid in your spiritual elevation, just like it is in meditation practices. And the other parallel or other component is being led and the willingness to be led. So just as one would submit themselves to a guru, or submit themselves to a teacher of a particular discipline, those in the gathering will submit themselves to the sound system selector, operator, and those on the microphone. And by that submission, you are submitting yourself to be taken on a journey. Therefore, you can relax into the experience. You can relax into the fact that you are going to be guided by various chapters and verses within the music, various novels of music, rhythm patterns. The people on the microphone are going to offer you <laughs> word, sound and power that you are going to absorb. The sound system operator is going to tune the sound system and the space is going to have been set so that you can relax and Surrender yourself to the willingness to be led in ceremony in the Rastafari Reggae Sound System Ceremony. So 
So normally, I, I, I think I should probably end with a conclusion, but I don't have a conclusion. There is no conclusion. I don't know what to conclude from everything that I have just outlined. I don't know what you should conclude. But what I do know is that there is an ideal. And if we can acknowledge the ideal of the various components that can constitute Rastafari reggae sound system having a universal spiritual significance, then we can identify the inevitable places where we have strayed from the ideal. Because we will have to stray from the ideal in order to keep playing sound system. There will be plenty of times where all of the things that I've outlined, only some of them can be manifested. And therefore, if we at least have some sense when we say things like sound system culture and some sense of the spiritual, ceremonial, ritualistic potency of Rastafari reggae sound system, if we share in the understanding of that, then we can identify where we have strayed from the ideal or where we've been forced to compromise from the ideal. And perhaps we can do things to mitigate against it. And that actually felt like a conclusion, even though my piece of paper literally reminds me to say there is no conclusion, but that felt quite conclusive and that wasn't planned. So That was what I had to say on the universal spiritual significance of Rastafari sound system. Give much thanks for your attention. There was plenty more to say. I, I realized I forgot to flip one of the pieces of paper. But I think we have a little bit of time now if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask or anything they would like to share. It doesn't have to even be a question. It's maybe a little bit off topic. Line in. <laughs> ah. So it might be a little bit off topic, but uh, off topic is okay. Yeah, yeah. I just want to know if you teach uh, or have some kind of tutorial for like dub mixing or dub uh, productions uh, for Ableton. Or... Yeah, we're working on that now. It's yeah, no, we're, we're working on um, a really immersive masterclass with myself and uh, Tippy from iGrade Dub. Um, and it's going to be a chance to really delve into the technical side of things, but also a chance to delve into the things that have been outlined in this talk as well. So just uh, all I can say is stay tuned. We are working yeah, on it. Long. Hi, I just want to say thank you. That was such an insightful talk. Um, I was wondering what you could say to us as people who've come to him, Dub, and who appreciate the culture, appreciate the music. What, what do you think... How do you see the future of uh, Dub gatherings in a spiritual sense, um, given that there is clearly a uh, commercialization of the culture and there is, as you pointed out, many directions that these sound system gatherings are taking which aren't spiritual. How do you, what would you say is our responsibility as people, you know, some of us who have not experienced the suffering that that reggae, Rastafari music came from? Mm -hmm. How do we create those spaces? How do we 
I don't know how to word on question. Uh, I think I got the question. Yeah, how can we make it spiritual, uh -huh. which is where that potency comes from? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and how can we honour that, which is the roots and what, what it's all about, I suppose? Well, if you asked me that 48 hours ago, specifically to your first point of your question of like, where do I see it going? I would have said, I uh, don't know. I'm very afraid of where it's going. But asking me that today, I can see that, you know, this gathering is absolutely uh, a tool to ensure that because as far as I'm aware, the organizers of this gathering are not at least explicitly Rastafari. However, they know the potency and the importance. So, him, I um, hope most people are aware, is the acronym for His Imperial Majesty, or I think His and Her Imperial Majesties, to signify Haile Selassie being crowned at the same time as Empress Menin. Now, they were under no obligation, according to the trends of today, to call the festival that. They could have called it jump up and down, mash up, baseline, dub <laughs> festival party. <laughs> and taking the responsibility to call it that. And, you know, there's these beautiful murals of his and her Imperial Majesty and inviting the brethren and sistering from the House of Rastafari and so forth is, you know, exactly in keeping with that. And the second part of your question, which is, I, I, I think I interpreted it as, you know, what seems to be kind of along the lines of the sort of cultural appropriation of, you know, what can be done and what is the right way to do it and what is the wrong way to do it, I think. I, I, I think everything I outlined is the best I can really say, but to try and summarize it, you know, it's like, be open to what is right and, and what is wrong. And, you know, try to view this phenomena from its root. It has a root, it has a very strong and important root. And reggae without Rastafari, I mean, reggae music has been enshrined by the UN as some kind of protected cultural artifact but they haven't wanted to enshrine the Rastafari component, which is kind of ironic because the United Nations became the United Nations after His Majesty helped reshape the League of Nations. I'm going to go well off topic if I start there, but um, keep Rastafari central to the music, it's that simple. And that doesn't make it, I think the anxiety that that breeds is that people think that makes it exclusive. Well, it, it's obviously far from exclusive. This is an open public event. It doesn't need to be something that creates anxiety. It doesn't matter if you know nothing about His Imperial Majesty, you know, but you can get to know. And it doesn't mean that you have to lock up or renounce whatever spiritual path that you're on or Go on any spiritual path if you're not on one. But to come to a gathering which has been severed from its root is, is not going to give you the fullness. You know, just like, you know, some forms of yoga are more like a kind of regurgitated Hindu aerobics than it, than it is actually its spiritual root. And, and that's, so what you can do is entirely up to you. I have no idea, you know, what, what, what you do in your life, but to try and answer your question broadly, accept that you're in a Rastafari gathering and that Haile Selassie is the central pillar of that and there's a very good reason for that. And there's probably something profound you could learn about your own life by being open to that and understanding what it was that electromagnetically drew you to the gathering in the first place. Thank you so much, that's perfect. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, 
you spoke a little bit about uh, hedonism and dance to other people facing towards the speaker. Yeah. And I was wondering if you had any ideas on how to construct the space in order to create a more spiritual event as opposed to something that's more hedonistic and more of a, a dance event, if that makes sense. Um, how to build the space, how to position the speakers, how to avoid it becoming purely hedonistic. Well, as many speakers as possible positioned equally along the circumference of the venue facing inwards, I think, is the antidote to that. Definitely not. Oh, that's something I forgot to mention. The use of flashing lights and, you know, uh, disco lights, uh, light, light shows and so forth. And as I said at the beginning, you know, I'm a photographer and a videographer and I love light. I love light. I love creating with light. It's a very powerful medium. But the use of lighting in the gathering, I think is light shows are synony synonymous with hedonism. Not exclusive to, but have become synonymous. So I think if you don't want people to go into the hedonistic realms, don't use flashing lights. It's much harder to be intoxicated in, in darkness. Um, intoxicated in a hedonistic way anyway. Um, and then it's the responsibility of people to do what they can to try and create that embodied morality. Uh, I mean, for me as a young person, when I walked into the, to the first gatherings, you know, I walked in with a can of beer in my hand. And I immediately realized two things. One, it didn't feel wholly appropriate. Two, it wasn't necessary. And then there was a profound sense of relief because I was a youth that really didn't like to be drunk, but I got drunk because it was what was happening, you know? And I didn't think there was a choice. But when I realized there was a space where I had a choice and that I could go out for the night and be in a space where I didn't have to do that, I immediately went for that option. And then the result was, you know, the rest of my life because it allowed me a sanctuary and a space to have all of the experiences to lay the foundation to finally end up here talking about it, you know? Thank you, yeah. You're welcome. I saw a hand go up over there somewhere, yeah. Hello. Hello. I just want to deeply thank you to bring uh, his wisdom here. It was my pleasure. Uh, um, I feel my spirituality was ignited when I first hear, heard the Bob Marley. And it's beautiful because in my path I've been in different, uh, let's say, like spiritual paths. And I feel in the last years I got a bit um, away, away from reggae and dub and this and Rastafari uh, culture. And it's so beautiful that today you brought the roots. And it's so um, inspiring to hear that it started with, with a circle with people. Um, dancing and getting into trance, into meditation. Um, and I'm just uh, yeah, really inspired and um, emotionally touched by, by what you brought to me. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Give thanks. I just, while well, the mic, no, no, it's all right. I just want to also say that I, I, I've got some articles here with me that I can't give you, but um, there's some of the articles that help me get some of the language to put this into words. And if you do want any more information, you can come and take pictures of them and 
or you can leave me your email address and I can email it to you. So if there's, if there's a lot more to this. So if you want more, come, come at the end and I can show you where to find it. Yeah. yeah so, uh, yeah, also really wanted to thank you really for me. It's um, really special, really important to, to listen this kind of reasoning on wisdom and, and I really appreciate and what I wanted to say is um, we've been talking about the, the future of the sound system scene and for me I must say I'm really hopeful and trustful toward the living sound system movement. Uh, I've been part of the Nomad Embassy Collective here in Portugal for the last two years, so I joined them afterward. And what I could see and I could notice that it's still really new, mainly here. I'm originally from France and I know that there. It's really bigger. But here in Portugal, I know that sound system has a lot to provide. And I see it in the, in the community where I live, the big community, I mean. That is more and more people uh, joining the session. And even though, if at first, you might not get the whole spirituality and wisdom and the rest of I can bring, I do believe that uh, the positive vibration and the way we play reggae music unite and slowly, slowly bring spirituality, spirituality sorry, and resonating to each and everyone. And for me, I was also into like, who am I to pretend to play jam music, even though I'm not carrying this kind of uh, this kind of suffering from the foundation, or I might not really know all the story behind it. Obviously, I got curious and I made my research, but at some point it was a bit like bringing me a bit of confusion. But what I could realize is that sound system, the way we play it, can be used also towards other objectives. And we link our project with permaculture and the philosophy of permaculture and sound system. For me, have really a lot to go together. And the way we play the sound system there support a lot this kind of regenerative project. And yes, I believe bring um, bring the unity in this uh, alternative um, new world that is uh, that is grown. Yes, just wants to share it. Okay, give thanks. I, I I don't think there was directly a question in the a sharing. A sharing, but the conflict that you felt, I think. It's, it's very difficult to give a talk like this and not address why that conflict exists. And I, I specifically don't, didn't want to get too much into that because I, whether or not the conflict is right or wrong, whether or not you should play the music or shouldn't play the music, is a question that has no answers. The fact that the paradox and the conflict exists is in some ways an answer to the question. You know, it's like, it doesn't make any sense. No, I should not do what I do. I should not play the music that I play. It doesn't make any sense from a rational perspective, from a literal intellectual perspective of the aims and objectives of reggae music in one way of looking at it, it makes no sense at all. However, whether it makes sense or not, or whether it's right or whether it's wrong, it's happening. And it's happening en masse. There is thousands and thousands of people choosing to do this. So, in life, we're always going to be faced with something that requires us to really examine ourselves. And I think if you've had a calling to play a significant part in reggae music, if you've had a calling in Rastafari, and you are not directly descended from the African brethren and sistren that were taken in slavery, who gave birth to this music, then you have to reconcile that within yourself and if you reconcile it or if you surrender to the reconciliation of that 
you will learn very important things about yourself. And at the end of that learning, it may still continue not to make sense. But something else will make sense that takes place and takes precedence over the intellectual rationalization. Because the music was born because there was some serious works that needed to be done. So wrestling with those intellectual struggles will put you in a better position to do some, some part of that serious work that needs to be done. And who and what and where that work is, is, is only you that can know that. No one else can define that. So it's a little something additional to what you shared. One last chance if anyone has any questions. No? So let's, let's seal it up there. Um, I've been saying this, that I, I think one of the things that I feel is started to be absent in the gatherings and absent in our daily life because of technology and the way that society is structured and the information that we are bombarded with is attention. Attention is at an all-time low. People's ability to focus and pay attention and stay present is at an all-time low. And attention is a divine quality and attention is the quality that is one of the most important qualities in the subject matter that I'm talking about. And I would like to just really say thank you for, to all of you for being present and for sharing your attention, not with me, but you've shared your attention with the subject matter and opened yourselves to listen to the subject matter. And this subject matter is something that is very worthy of attention. So I really thank you for, for your devotion and your time this afternoon. <laughs>